The Lord be with you. Welcome to Sunday Bible Class. We are recording this Saturday evening, uh, it's January 1st. Uh, church has been uh, postponed for tomorrow due to weather conditions, a little ice, a little snow, really cold temperatures. So we're going to take advantage of some time to go through our Bible class. We're covering Mark chapter 7, and I'm going to read that for us and then go over the notes that I have prepared. So if you want to find Mark chapter 7 in your Bible, on your Bible app, or what have you, that would be great. Mark chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. We're going to stop there for just a moment. Now, in our study of the Gospel of Mark, every chapter begins with a simple listing of the things Jesus did and the things Jesus said. That's primarily what the Gospels bring to us. The words and actions of our Savior Jesus. Now many of us in our Bibles can figure that out fairly easily thanks to the subtitles that are given. So, so far what we've read is we see Jesus interacting with some Pharisees and scribes. The next portion is Jesus interacting with regular people with the topic being food laws. And then finally, Jesus interacts with a Syrophoenician woman on the topic of who receives Jesus, who gets Jesus. And then Jesus heals a man who is deaf. Now the things Jesus says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs and be opened. Now maybe it's what Jesus says to the man who is deaf that gives us the theme for this whole chapter. Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears and says in Aramaic, Ephatha, be opened. And the man's ears, as if they were covered, they're open and he's able to hear. When Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the scribes and the common people, The idea of being open is what Jesus is 
explaining to them. Jesus is willing to interact with the people. Jesus has no problem with the Pharisees and the scribes coming to him, asking him questions. Why is it that your disciples do not follow the law of Moses? And when Jesus is finished with this group, he shows that he's willing to interact with the regular people as well. The people have been taught, they've just been taught improper things. And so Jesus is always willing to interact with people. Now, first off, the Pharisees are concerned with the defilement of Jesus' disciples. But I think that really masks their real concern. This event, Jesus' disciples, his followers, not following the law of Moses. It could add evidence to the case against Jesus. On this day, his disciples were not following the law of Moses. What true Messiah, if that's what he really is, what true Messiah would not discipline his disciples? What true Messiah would shirk the laws of Moses? And I think this shows a distinction from the people at the end of chapter 6 and the people here at the beginning of chapter 7. So you have to go back to chapter 6 for a bit. Jesus is in the region of Gennesara, a town halfway between Magdala and Capernaum, two very common places Jesus visited And while he's in Magdala, in that region, people are bringing the sick to Jesus in the hope that the sick could just touch the fringe of Jesus' cloak and be healed. And many such people did just that. They were faithful. Faithful seekers. People looking for Jesus. The Pharisees, as we'll talk in a moment or two, they were faithful, but their faith was not found in Christ. They were faithful to words, not to the Word. The Word made flesh who made his home with us. There are words about defilement. Defilement may be the fancy word for making impure. That's a big religious topic. We may get more insight when we look at John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11, uh, 1 through 12. And the wedding at Cana, the first miracle Jesus performed. There were six stone jars that were used for ritual cleansing. Each of those jars holding 20 to 30 gallons of water. Their use was for ritual cleansing. Nothing dirty, unclean, impure would come into the presence of God. Throughout Mark chapter 6, when Jesus heals someone possessed by a demon, Frequently, Jesus deals with an unclean spirit. 
compared to a clean spirit. Those who are dirty. There are ways to get clean. And there are those who are given the proper garments to wear. Think of the story of the wedding feast at the end. Where there was one man in the feast who passed up the garments the king gave him. And the king had that man thrown outside of the wedding hall. So to defile is to make him pure. And the Pharisees were asking, why did the disciples defile themselves by doing what is forbidden? So the Pharisees, I said before we talk about this, they're playing the role of religious enforcers, religious bouncers. They determine who gets in and who is kept out. They knew the law and they were going to make sure that the law was being followed. Whose law? The law of Moses. That is a good law, but it's not it's not fully God's law. Jesus talks about also the traditions. The elders, uh, the, the Pharisees bring up the tradition of the elders. That's what is called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is oral tradition. Explains and goes into detail on a whole host of topics. Within this Mishnah, there are six orders. Seeds, festivals, women, damages, holy things, and purities. It's like a commentary on the Old Testament. It's important without question. But at times it appears that God's word and the traditions of the elders are not balanced. The tradition of the elders, the Mishnah, is held higher than God's word or it sits over God's word and judges God's word. So the Pharisees kind of give away what they think is important. And they do that in verse 5. Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat with defiled hands. And you get the impression, as I kind of said a moment ago, that there is a competition between God's word and between this Mishnah, the tradition of the elders. I think we could see the concern there the danger. And so a question we would ask in class, is there a parallel to this in Lutheranism or in other parts of Christianity? And I think the answer is yes. Maybe you say, well, what is that? We have the Book of Concord which is the Lutheran Confessions, the confessional documents of our church body. It's the creeds, the small catechism, the Augsburg Confession, the apology to the Augsburg Confession, the small called articles. Part of that is the 
power and primacy of the Pope, the formula of Concord, the solid declaration, all of these things that outline what we believe, teach, and confess. So sometimes, as we have the Word of God here, and the Book of God, a uh, Book of Concord here, sometimes they're in balance, and sometimes, unfortunately, they're not. And again, we let other things sit in judgment on God's Word. When it's the other way around, God's Word sits in judgment on us. And the authors of our confessional documents, this is what they wanted. They wanted God's Word on top. That the writings in the Book of Concord Support, explain, clarify. They're not without error, but we do subscribe to them. God's word alone is without error. So the conversation of Jesus and the Pharisees is pretty important. As Jesus then moves on to talk to the people, you'll see that. This is Jesus teaching to help the people understand that maybe they weren't taught fully, completely. So let's see, this is verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them then, said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus Jesus declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. So it's not that Jesus just simply rejects the Pharisees' teaching. This is about all of the kosher food laws, right? The purities section of the Mishnah. But Jesus offers a correction, Right? Do you know someone who does an excellent job at pointing out a problem, but when it comes time to offer a solution, they have nothing to say? Jesus doesn't just reject the Pharisees' understanding of the law. He offers a correction. It's what comes out of a person that defiles him. And Jesus then would say kind of the same thing to his own disciples, declaring all foods clean. It's not what goes in that makes you dirty, impure, defiled. It's what comes out. Dietary laws are nullified, and this would have a tremendous impact on the mission work of the church. Just think about where the church started 
where it has gone. Various cultural contexts. Food. Food laws would have been strange. A hindrance. And in the early decades of the church, those same laws would prove problematic for Peter and Paul and others. So Jesus' words here are very important. And then the last thing, and we're going to stop. I only got through verse 23 for the handout for class. What defiles humanity? Again, it's not food. But he lists 12 items, beginning with sexual immorality. Six are behaviors. The other six are attitudinal. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness. Six behaviors. And then the attitudes. Deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Those are concerning. God is concerned with cleanliness. God makes cleanliness possible. The burden is removed from you. I know I've said it before in in sermons and probably in other Bible classes. When we talk about cleanliness, I find it so amusing when uh, Jesus and Peter and some others are in a boat and there is the miraculous catch of fish, the time when they have to call to shore for another boat to come out and help them. Peter has a glimpse of who Jesus is. They're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, get away from me. I am an unclean man. The humor is that they're in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Where does Peter expect Jesus to go? Swim for shore, get away from me. But get away from me is right. Peter was unclean. By associating with Peter, Jesus runs the risk of becoming unclean. But that's what Jesus is there for. Jesus exchanging his inherent cleanliness for Peter's dirt, for our dirt. Cleanliness is important to God. Sin cannot be in God's presence, but God can be in the presence of our sin. Isn't that Part of the Christmas message, Jesus making his home with sinners. And so what we have in our life with God isn't baptism about cleanliness. To baptize is to wash. The water and the word God's forgiveness, it cleanses us from all sin. We are given that clean garment. We make that garment dirty by our unholy living. Those six behaviors and six attitudes 
And that cleanliness is renewed as we respond to the Lord's invitation to feast with him in communion. And finally, what do we see when our days are done? The funeral pall that is draped over our casket. A solemn, solid reminder what God began in our baptisms, he has brought to completion in our death. Cleanliness is important to God. It's not what foods you do or do not eat. It's what God in Christ Jesus has done for you, cleansing you. So be open. The Pharisees had a hard time. They knew what they knew. And they had a hard time receiving Jesus. That's not a criticism of them. Maybe I have some rigidity in my thinking. Maybe you do too inflexible. We know what we know and we know it well and that is what we're going to do. But then we learn somebody else has a different way to accomplish the same thing. We are open to the teaching of our Lord to his correcting. So that's what we were going to cover in class. We got through the first half of chapter 7. The next time we have class, we'll do the remainder. But I appreciate uh, your time in watching this today. And I pray that you found it enlightening and encouraging. Thanks again. Bye-bye.